Good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. Is the mic, you can hear me okay? Um, I am Nancy Soderberg, the uh, country director for Kosovo, and delighted to be with all of you here today for this important discussion. And want to uh, thank so much for the Mayor Karishan for the, uh, for the well warm welcome to this fabulous city of Budapest and for your um, strengthening the importance of sustainability of democracy. It's uh, a lot of work to keep democracy going and we at the National Democratic Institute uh, work across the globe in trying to strengthen democratic institutions, make government more responsive to citizens and to uh, work with mayors across the uh, world to try and build strong democracy. So I'm just delighted that so many uh, of you were able to join us today. I want to also thank our host, the City of Budapest Political Capital and the CEU uh, Democracy Institute for putting together such a extraordinary uh, panel and uh, two-day session here in this beautiful city. Uh, so to those of you online and in person, welcome. And we look forward to fantastic discussions. Um, my own background is in politics in the United States, presidential campaigns, the Senate, the National Security Council at the White House, the UN, and a whole variety of uh, nonprofits. And um, now I'm in Kosovo working with the National Democratic Institute and see many of the same challenges across uh, the region that we all face. And a gathering like this gives us all uh, new ideas of how to be innovative and make democracy work. Um, we're delighted to be together with this panel, um, Should Mayors Rule the World? Uh, democracy, Trust, and Citizens Engagement at the Local Level. And this morning, uh, we have three in, uh, incredible mayors with us today who will discuss the importance of municipal governments, governance in fostering civic engagement, how local democracy can serve to inform the national level political discourse, um, and the role of cities in innovating new forms of democratic engagement. Um, NDI works across the region, and our research shows that cities are often the first responders to crises. I think um, they're more innovative, they're more in touch with the local citizens, they have more engagement, they're not um, often the capitals uh, disconnected from the citizens. And I think we've seen this very vividly in the COVID crisis where it was the mayors who were innovating, um, demanding measures to keep their population safe, masks, vaccines, dealing with the schools, dealing with the health crises. Um, so what we're going to do today is highlight some of the successes and really discuss if we'd be better off if mayors ruled the world. So um, looking forward to a very lively discussion and uh, wanted to just briefly introduce our um, panelists. I'll start with online, who, Anna Luisa Boni, um, who is uh, coming to us um, as Secretary General of Euro Cities. Really, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, she's been in that position since 2014. Thank you so much and welcome. Um, next, we have uh, Mayor Alexandra uh, Dulke, uh, Dulkovic. Um, uh, uh, Dulkovic is not too bad. Um, but a long history of city in, um, in, in Gdansk, working up the ranks, and now uh, mayor since 2019. Um, and then we have the mayor of um, Zagreb, Tomislav Tomasevich. Thank you so much for being here. He's a longtime activist in the environment since he was a, a teenager, mayor since uh, elected last May of 2021. Um, and then we have Mayor Matej Valo of Bratislava, um, who's also an architect and known, I think, hit the stage with your plan Bratislava, which made waves and uh, was an extraordinary uh, development, and he's been in that position since um, 2018. So let me, um, let me start um, with you. Um, and I think uh, you've seen City from uh, the, the, the going through the council and then uh, difficult circumstances and you know, taking over the mayorship with um, the challenges of Gdansk and some of the political crises. And wanted to just start with you um, 
and then we'll ask for the others to jump in, but perhaps we could uh, turn it over to you and um, talk about the, the COVID crisis and how the local government has responded to the needs of the citizens and, and what lessons um, could we take from your experiences, and I'll turn to the others next on, with COVID, what, what worked in COVID that might work for other instances? It was a crisis where everyone had to jump in and respond. So let me just begin with you. It worked. Yep. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's, it's working. Good morning, everyone, uh, all uh, fellow mayors and all the people uh, who are taking care of democracy on all, all the levels. Um, good to be with you here in Budapest. Mm, reply, replying to your questions, there are several lessons. Mm, um, first of all, um, I do think that we need to rethink our strategies because this crisis showed that all our faraway thinking uh, had been just gone and we need to decide what are the basic values we need to focus again. For example, Something which is extremely important, uh, I do think, not only in Poland, not only in Hungary, in general in Europe, in states, uh, is uh, lack of trust to each other. Uh, definitely, COVID crisis showed, for example, in Poland, that lack of trust between citizens, government, those who are taking the decisions, those who are explaining what is going on, are not being trusted. Why is it so? Yeah, this is not the room <laughs> where we should uh, put this diagnose. So people trusted more local authorities because we were trying to be closer to them, trying to help, trying to explain what's going on, trying to as far as we could without not knowing the not knowing the uh, the reasons, the the data uh, and and all of it. So trust is something what we definitely need to build. Um, how to build it? I think that every single person has several uh, ideas. Um, I think that in Gdansk, in my city, for example, we definitely uh, carry on um, different local forms of democracy, of building the trust and let the citizens to be involved in deciding, in deciding what to do uh, in the local area. So first of all, trust. Secondly, we need to, because this is the basic value where we can build actually sustainable society, sustainable democracy, sustainable city and country. Secondly, we need to uh, take care more about locality because this COVID crisis showed that all the idea of the uh, state, of the global companies is not really that useful if for one day to another something is cut down and you have to somehow survive without uh, without deliveries from all over the world and so on and so on. So this shows again that our strategies uh, must be revised, must be changed to build um, the local communities that can survive together. But it means, uh, it doesn't mean that we cannot cooperate this is obvious we have to cooperate because we definitely live in a global global world but we need to rethink how to do it thank you let me ask the others to uh, comment on those remarks or add your own yes first of all uh, uh, thank you for inviting me thank you to the organizers to the mayor of Budapest all the other organizers I also greet you here. Uh, as you heard, I'm, uh, let's say, a brand new mayor. I just had my first 100 days uh, last weekend. So this is my first international. So this is my first international event and trip uh, to come as a mayor of Zagreb. And uh, this also shows uh, how important this event is for us. Because you can imagine how many problems you have uh, when you just become the mayor and we decided to find time to really be here. 
Uh, Zagreb was in a, a specific situation during the pandemic because we were also, we also had a combination of, unfortunately, of natural uh, disasters of pandemic plus the earthquake. We had a devastating earthquake in the March of 2020. So this was a really, you know, it was like a Hollywood movie, you know, if you, if you, if you watch it, you would say, no, this cannot happen. I mean, you know, you just have a pandemic and now during the middle of pandemic and a huge lockdown, you suddenly have a devastating earthquake, which is the strongest in the last 130 years in Zagreb. And like, you know, how this combination was unbelievable. So we had to really uh, struggle as a city uh, on how to, how to manage this. First of all, the lesson I think the city learned, and I was the city parliament member for the last four years, uh, I think that the city learned also, and the whole country during the pandemic is how important is the public health system. And I think, you know, we can, especially maybe also in Central and Eastern Europe, we can maybe also have specific insights on that. The second thing is how important is the civil prote civic protection mechanisms and services that are in place for this kind of disasters. Uh, we had a tradition of that which was lost in the last few decades. Uh, and now we are start, starting to rebuild these kind of services where actually we engage the citizens to be volunteers in these kind of natural disasters. And what we learned also is that you cannot actually engage citizens when these disasters happen. You have to engage them much before because, because you have to train them before. So once the disasters hit, I mean, then it's too late. Also what we learned, of course, is uh, how important it is to preserve the, the fabric of society, the most endangered group, the most vulnerable groups in these kind of disasters. This was a huge uh, pressure on our, on our social and welfare systems on how to keep this social tissue together. Also what we learned is the media landscape, this was also addressed in the, in the uh, Mayor of Budapest's introductory speech. The media landscape, which is also quite difficult and also um, with the social networks, etc., fighting fake news in this kind of situation is very, very challenging. So, so also the information, the education, building trust uh, with citizens in this kind of crisis uh, is also very demanding. And also, I, I would say the, one of the lessons learned was that um, it's very difficult to answer this kind of crisis if you didn't make any preparation on on these kind of things that might happen. And we, I hope we will not have a pandemic, a new pandemic soon, but we, might, but we are definitely gonna have a very different natural disasters related to climate change. And this is unfortunately the future. So, so we cannot stand a chance uh, if we just go into our daily politics and uh, you know, try to just uh, extinguish political daily fires without thinking ahead and preparing for this kind of events. Because when these events happen, then it's, then it's quite too late. And also, I would say the, for the last uh, lesson is the flexibility of the city. Uh, the city, I think it's much more flexible to adapt to this kind of uh, crisis than the national state. I think the national state has a slower apparatus and especially in the city, I mean, if you look at uh, the, the physical space, uh, how it was changing, how, how the more people were using bikes all of a sudden uh, because they were, uh, they were, it was uh, a bit, uh, they were afraid to use public transport. So you had to adapt on these kind of circumstances. I think that we have to really design the cities in this kind of way so they are more flexible and faster to adapt to these kind of challenges, which I'm fearing will be more in the future. So I'll leave it. I'll leave here. Mayor Vella. <coughs> Again, thank you very much for having me here. I'm happy to be part of this forum and, of course, summit of Baghdad Free Cities as well. I mean, my colleagues already mentioned uh, very important points. Maybe I will add another three uh, three points. The first one is already mentioned the the, the fragile fabric of public trust. That's that's very important because if you don't have a public trust, and this is something which we are working a lot of, you cannot ask your citizen to, 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 to follow some rules. I mean, I know I put it in a very simple way, but this is just true. Uh, 
the crisis uh, became, the pandemic became, uh, started one year before any kind of vaccine was available, at least in Slovakia. So uh, we have this we have communication campaign, which was our only vaccine is, is discipline. And we have very good result in first wave of COVID. We have uh, like three dead, uh, death in Bratislava during the first uh, uh, COVID wave. And we have very, we have very good results. And was mainly in Bratislava because what about that people are following the rule, mask, distance, washing hands, and, and, and uh, lockdown. And you cannot have this thing without the public trust. And, in some way, we have a new government during the pandemic. There was an election just a few days before pandemic really kick in. And uh, they weren't really able to, to deliver the, the good results. So the, we, we were forced to take some uh, issues, maybe also national issues, in our hands. And we work a lot uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the communication and uh, uh, explaining what's happening, uh, trying to ask people to follow the rules, and you cannot do it without the public trust. So this is one of the main issues. And today, when the, this kind of, today, years ago, when this populism wave started washing across the whole world or Europe, uh, the public trust is one of the key elements. The second thing is my mantra, which was always having a plan and team. Of course, you cannot, uh, nobody had, uh, had a plan for pandemic, but, what we did, we really quickly understand, as I am sure everybody else, that this is a serious issue, and we tried and we worked a lot during the first weeks of pandemic on the plan, what we are going to do, who are the most vulnerable groups, how are we going to help them, what are the communications plan again, uh, financial situation and so on, and team, this is something plan and team, and this is something uh, which was very important for me to see that uh, I have a good team. You cannot really understand if you have a good team or if you are not in crisis, and in crisis you understand many things, and I understand that I choose uh, people around me in a very good way, and I'm very happy that I have them. My vice uh, mayor is here, so I'm, I'm happy she's here. And, uh, and the th last thing is partnership. Uh, was very incredible that uh, biggest world and also local companies which uh, have their uh, which uh, are staying in Slovakia just uh, give us a call they gave us a call and start to ask how we can help the Kia help us the the biggest Slovak bank help us a lot the, the shopping mall help us they deliver food for free for our workers and for uh, people without the homes for for different months so it it the partnership across the, the city and the state, the city and the public, uh, private sector, and the city as, of course, different communities is absolutely important. And we understand that we need to work on it. Also, even there is no pandemic. We knew that before, of course, we, but we understand now how very important it is. Well, uh, thank you, and Ms. Boney, let me now uh, turn to you and maybe sum up this um, kind of discussion on um, what can we what what can we learn uh, we've heard um, from the first three comments uh, we have to combat disinformation trust is a big issue be prepared have a plan and uh, a, a good team in place get partners have discipline um, there's a lot of uh, of lessons learned there and from your 25 years of experience working with the um, EU perhaps you could um, close out this question by sort of what, what should mayors make sure they have in place to deal with the next crisis, whether it's an earthquake or another pandemic or some other issue, and thank you. Yes, if you don't mind, I'd like to, uh, because I was inspired by what was said, and by the way, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for uh, Mayor Karaksoni, who did a great speech, and I'm very privileged to be in this panel with three of you know important mayors that are part of our network, EuroCity. So um, hello everyone. Uh, I would like to actually say another thing because it's important to, from our observatory, if we have to look at lessons, it's not only lessons to cities. I think there's a big lesson that needs to be given to the EU, to Europe and to the national governments. And the main one for me is exactly the title of this panel, 
yes, mayors should rule the world. <laughs> because despite difficulties and mistakes, just look at the extent and the way in which cities have been at the forefront of this crazy crisis. And, you know, they all said it completely new. Look at how they managed to respond to citizens' concerns and needs in the last two years while not having, you know, the full competences, formal competence that normally uh, member states, for instance, have, or even, uh, and especially the sufficient resources. So, you know, cities have been the hardest hit by the crisis, right? And they have dealt with really comp complex urban challenges. They have been that have been described just now. You know, unemployment, increased poverty, isolation, mental health, even in a big way. You know, local businesses closing down, and so on, with you know um, a stretched uh, also budget. So you know, I think that the big lesson is that city leaders are the real European leaders of these historical times. And in terms of uh, also lessons for cities, what we've done is that thanks to, we've created a platform that is called COVID News in EuroCities, where we've collected over 1,000 1, stories from cities across Europe, exactly on how all the things that have been, you know, just partially uh, picked up by these three mayors, um, you know, have been inspiring for other cities and also uh, trying not only to find solutions and explain about solutions in terms of the health emergency, but more and more um, looking at how this crisis uh, could actually be turned into an opportunity and also into a, an investment in more sustainable, sustainable in a broader sense, not only environmental, but also social and so on, sustainable choices, you know. So all these stories that we cannot uh, capture in one word are a lesson that shows the important role of cities and mayors in the front line and how they have been key to actually get countries, cities, countries and Europe, not only out of the emergency, phase, you know, like uh, the one that was described, but also in showing the way and the ambition to set, uh, you know, the direction towards a just uh, and sustainable recovery. So I think, yes, they can, they have learned a lot. There are a lot of lessons for cities, but the main lessons would be, I think, for the, you know, uh, other gov levels of government and trying to demonstrate that actually, because cities have been the center of this crisis now, they need also to be at the center of the resources uh, to recover. Oh, thank you so much. And um, I appreciate you being here as well. So we're delighted to have you uh, with us. Uh, let me turn to our second area of discussion. Um, and it's building a little bit on the issue of trust. And the um, polls show that trust in governments is declining, uh, not just in this region, but worldwide. Democracies um, at its lowest level around the world, according to Freedom House, um, in the last 15 years. Um, and NDI research in Central Europe shows that um, citizens, and particularly um, the youth, um, view their work in local government uh, very favorably. So you can inspire the youth to um, perhaps get more engaged and help build the chances for change. And I wanted to start with um, Mayor Tomasevich, since you have been um, involved since you were very young in the Croatian Youth Network um, and uh, yourself got involved in politics at a very, uh, very young age, perhaps um, addressing the issue of trust, um, let's just dig a little bit deeper on how um, how can cities help restore um, trust in democracy more broadly and through the youth, but also other other thoughts you might have on that. <laughs> it's a million dollar question, I would say, and not only for local governments. Um, well. Uh, I started young as an environmental activist and actually uh, I started in a small uh, youth organization, uh, but uh, ambitious and naive as I was, uh, I jumped to global scale. And I, when I was 20 years old, I was uh, leading a global youth movement uh, in sustainable development UN process. Uh, so I was an advisor to United Nations Environment Program, and I thought this is the the place to change the world. You know, why, you know, if you want to change the world, go on a global level in the UN processes. 
and then I found out this is not really the case. And it's not really easy, and you know, with the climate negotiations, and I, I started 2002 in World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, South Africa, and then I saw that we are not really moving forward with the climate change agenda, with social justice agenda, with the environmental agenda, etc. And then I went back to the local level. I st said, okay, I think this is the place maybe to start. And, uh, and I think really it's, uh, I think this is really the, the difference uh, because, and I always were, was more attracted when I speak about politics as an institutional politics to the local level more than to national level because I think you are closer to the citizens on a local level politics. I mean, you can really talk with them. You can understand their issues, their, their problems, their struggles. And you can experiment with some institutional innovations. You can engage them. You can participate with them. Uh, and this is much more difficult for national uh, government and uh, as Mayor Karachoni said in his speech, especially for supranational organizations, where you have, which are even more distant. And then you have even less, I th you have even more distrust issues between citizens and these kind of institutions. So uh, I think uh, from, from our perspective and our experience, we started, uh, we established a local political party in Zagreb only four years ago. Uh, two months before the elections. Nobody saw us coming. Uh, I won only less than 4% as a candidate for a mayor four years ago. But we managed to, end with 7%, we managed to enter the city parliament with only four seats uh, out of 51. And just for four years, we were doing our job. We were actually in the streets. We were speaking with the citizens. We were a fierce opposition to the government which was in place for 20 years in Zagreb. We had the same mayor for 20 years. Uh, I won't go into his legacy because I think it's widely known. And, but uh, we were really trying to understand citizens' problems and really always proposing solutions to change them. And somehow we started to gain more and more trust from the citizens in these four years. And now, and then on the last elections, uh, so a few months ago, four months ago, from less than 4% in the first round, uh, I got 40, 45%. And, uh, and in the second round, we had a landslide victory of almost 65%. Is that because you were seen as doing your job? Well, um, I think we what, were seen what, that's as a huge being... 40, 40 points, and uh, what I what think we were seen as that? really somebody who cares for citizens, who is not distant from them, who is willing to engage them, because for me, uh, for this, the whole question of the conference, the sustainability of the democracy, for me, representative democracy is, is one type of democracy. And I think to sustain the trust in representative democracy, I think we have to extend it, especially on a local level, because it's much easier to participatory democracy and direct democracy. So in order to strengthen the representative democracy, I think we also have to strengthen the other models of uh, democracy. And then this would, I think, uh, this leads to more trust uh, to people actually participating and actually being uh, asked about the things and decisions that affect them. And then they feel, I, I think they feel then more ownership for these decisions. And so this before. kind of transparency and uh, participatory innovations, I think this is the way forward. And this can happen easier on a local level. And I'll, I'll turn to Ms. Boney next, but before you leave the stage, just maybe f from having been a youth activist yourself, um, the youth, in my own experience in our NDI research, I think shows that youth, and to some extent women as well, um, they're willing to just ask why things have to be this way and dream about how it should be. And you said you started out as ambitious and naive. Is it because the youth don't know what they can't do and they just go for it and half the time succeed? Or, I mean, how, just as mayors and people trying to learn the best practices, um, just comment briefly on the, the role of the youth and how to engage them. Because the, if you look at history, it's the youth that really change things. Um, and so the more they're engaged, the better the outcomes often. So just as a youth activist yourself, what, would, what, what can other mayors do to get the youth engaged in these solutions? Well, I, I don't think I have a, a, a magic formula for that. Uh, but uh, from my point of view, and we were quite successful in, in engaging young people into our political campaigns. Uh, 
uh, more than any other party. Any, any tricks you can? Well, I think you have, I think the, the uh, I, th I don't know the magic formula, but we try to speak the language of the youth in terms of forms of communication, and we try to treat young people not as a problem, which usually politicians do, condescending, you know, uh, like, you know, you should do this, the young people today are this or that. I, th I think, you know, you, you always have this trap of falling into this kind of prejudice instead of like treating young people uh, on the same level and treating them uh, as partners, as potential, and at the, not always as a problem of society, you know. In my age, the young people are this and that, and today young people are this, you know, I, I think this, it's always this kind of illusion. Then when you get older, then you look things differently, but I think, you know, you should listen more to young people, and then actually you might speak their language. Mayor Valla wanted to jump in. I just want to jump in with quick thing, because there is one word which was <coughs> spoken here, very, which is very important for me, which is to be naive. And if we are talking about young people, and I feel young, that's me, kind of, that's us still, I hope, <laughs> kind of, also, of course, you. Yeah, uh, all of you. Uh, <laughs> sorry for that. Uh, to be naive sometimes can mean not have experience. And sometimes experience, which is very important uh, in managing everything, brings you some limitations. So young generation is fantastic in this that you don't have experience that they think cannot be done because somebody already wasn't able to deliver. And you just again go, uh, go for it. Maybe you're bouncing with your head on the wall, but maybe you are the one who is able finally to, to break the wall. So, so this is very important, like naive, not to be stupid, just sometimes try something which maybe some people with more experience already say is not possible. The um, National Democratic Institute runs a European democracy youth network throughout Europe, and what we see time and time again is um, they don't accept the limits, and that's where the naivety comes in as brilliance. Uh, why, you know, it's the famous George Bernard Shaw quote, some men see things as they are and ask why, others ask, see things as they might be and ask why not? And that's just such a powerful innovation. So let me turn to Ms. Boney as well, and please um, add, on, add, add on youth, or just more generally to the, the, this session's question is how can you build trust more broadly? Well, I think that there is already a lot of experience across uh, European cities in this respect, uh, because of course it's so much easier than the European and the national level to, to be connected to the ground, of course. Uh, and of course, there are cities that are more for which it's a newer thing, and for other that it's a little bit less new. But it's clearly a trend, and it's not, of course, easy. But it's uh, it's clearly um, lived as something that cannot um, cannot be you know cannot not be followed. Um, and it's really about uh, developing partnerships with with people, with youth, but not only with uh, so many types of groups with so many also uh, actors of society. It's a real, it's a real um, uh, sort of participatory um, uh, approach that really has to uh, be part of the way you govern a city. And these partnerships do not come you know, automatically or, or things like that. They are really the result of long processes and above all of this political will willingness to not only uh, you know, tick a box, but really to change the role of local government uh, as well, and in, in, in the first place. You know, local government cannot see itself as a service provider anymore, but it has to be seen uh, as an enabler of societal, you know, solutions and uh, community building. It's really about, you know, shifting to another paradigm and getting to accept that it's a matter of uh, power sharing. So it's not only, of course, you know, there are different phases, information, consultation, but it's really about co-building, co-designing, co-deciding, um, you know, public policies and uh, services uh, together and where the power goes out of the, you know, the, the political government, the political, you know, um, scope of the, of the local uh, authority. 
of the mayor, of the of the city government, of the administration. It's really about uh, improving democracy in this respect, but not uh, damaging representative democracy. On the contrary, it's about reinforcing it, complementing it, and getting to, at the end of the day, it's a matter of wanting to get to better decisions, right? And more corresponding to the, the, the needs, and even to create responsibility among the people that then uh, will, you know, use the solutions, will uh, even develop the solutions and improve the quality of life for everyone. So, you know, the the, the sort of, um, if you, we had a survey among our members with like around 180 cities, which is quite a lot. And of course, the, the sort of, uh, half of them already are into co-designing activities with, uh, you know, with the local communities. Uh, only like, 40, uh, they use really the co-decision mechanism, which is very, very, you know, it's also very pushed. And there are, you know, there are mechanisms and, and there are tools uh, that, you know, allow this sort of uh, participatory governance to actually happen. But it's all a matter of experimenting. It's, but the basis of all that, it's really about accepting that you need to share the power with other actors that are not yourself as a local government. So I think, yes, cities can play a huge part in restoring trust and in reinforcing democracy and in really reinventing the way public policy are made for a better, uh, you know, and a sustainable quality of life. Oh, thank you. And uh, Mayor Djilkovic will uh, close with you on, on this piece. And um, I think Sharing power is one of the most difficult things that people in power have to do. It's, um, it, it's seductive. They like it, and it's hard to leave. They don't want uh, want to want to give it up. So I think that's very useful food for, uh, for thought. But um, there, how would you s answer the question of how can you restore that, that trust? Well, um, of course, uh, sharing power, empowerment, uh, sharing responsibility is extremely important. But I would say that uh, one or two steps before this, we need to really put uh, more effort to education. Education in a sense of, um, but put it together, right? Education, how important is democracy, showing real, real examples, real cases, and so on and so on, put together with the real empowerment. Because very often, I can see it for past um, years after the changes in the world, after following up the communistic system and so on and so on, we put much effort into education without giving this uh, sharing the power or sharing the responsibility. Or we were just being naive, giving somebody responsibility without this background. I think this is extremely important to put those uh, two together because this only can build um, responsible um, society, responsible community at the, at the local level. This, I think that those are really um, real examples I have in my city when we have uh, in, in local districts, we have people who are, um, they want to take the power, they want to take part of the responsibility without knowing how the process are going or without knowing the, 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 the rules, the idea, the legal issues and so on and so on. So this is not easy, but to put those, uh, those two area together, mm, well, <laughs> we will have to do it. We don't have any other choice actually. Having to do it without the choice is, is something that most um, people would think is one of the biggest challenges. And um, yeah, you're, I think the leadership that we're hearing from today is, is take that chance and, um, and just do it. Uh, it makes a big difference. Um, I wanted to turn to our last subject, but also uh, warn the audience that I'm going to save five minutes at the end um, for any questions that you might have. If you don't have questions, that's fine. We'll continue it. But just to warn you to think about a little question from the audience. Um, and um, so for our, our last um, discussion here, uh, I wanted to just talk about innovations. 
um, and use your examples as mayors. Um, what, what are, what's the, some of the funnest and most impactful ideas? And is it okay to have ideas that fail? Um, what, what is it that you could learn for both the communications innovations, the technical innovations, um, to make your governments more responsive to the citizens' need and to get citizens involved? A lot of people don't think that they can be in government. That's not their job. They're, that's other people who are in government. So how do you really foster that civic engagement? And just maybe uh, go around, maybe we could start with um, Mayor Vallo, just just some innovations from all three, and then um, we'll close with um, perhaps a comment from Ms. Boney on how the European cities have learned to innovate. And then we'll open it up for just a, a question or two from the audience, and um, over to you. So uh, during the, the crisis, the, the first uh, weeks of crisis, and of course with the lockdown, uh, we concentrate a lot of communication. With, uh, the, we try to not left no uh, left nobody behind so we try to do all these services like phone lines and uh, call numbers for um, elderly people for example all the things many people many cities of course did and we already had it before but we try to do it in completely different way to to be sure that everybody can be heard but uh, what we did during the last and we started st fortunately we started to do it before the crisis, but during the crisis, we really push on it, our digital services. That's very important. Uh, we were lucky enough to want uh, uh, this uh, kind of help from Bloomberg. So they're helping us to shape our digital services. And what we're doing now is uh, the property tax collection, which is the most used, uh, or this is, very, I mean, everybody must do paid, so like it's used by everyone. So we're now trying to really find uh, how much we are spending of our money to collect one euro and trying to, to have this number in very small. And the digital way is, of course, uh, the very good way. And of course, the public space uh, reconstruction and regeneration, this is the second thing. Uh, we have, after the lockdown, uh, for example, the shops, were, uh, the, the, we have this different kind of lockdown, so you can go outside, but you can go, you cannot go to the shopping mall. So a lot of people start to use the public space, a lot of people start to uh, use our parks, and uh, to really invest uh, in these uh, facilities uh, was always important for us, but now we understand that we can really help uh, many people to go on if we have a super quality public space. And of course, uh, this is what, as I mean, architects, was always uh, one of my priorities. And we have, uh, when I became mayor, we founded uh, this, uh, we created this Metropolitan Institute of Bratislava, which is the institu institution focused on uh, urban research, planning, and participation. So this is very important for us as well, participation. We are going to publish in a few weeks from now the first uh, very, in the history of Bratislava, the first, uh, this manual of participation, which can be used by any city in Slovakia. Very big material, a lot of stuff, a lot of analysis, a lot of uh, ways have to re do real participation. Because participation was always this kind of buzzword uh, between uh, local uh, municipal politicians, but many times it was just the buzzword, you know, with no real solution. And to do the participation in the right way is a difficult process. You need to be very, uh, very honest with it. You need, need to pro promise only you can really deliver. And so we are going to rebuild this trust in participation. And we are publishing just a few weeks from now very good material for it. Helps to be an architect in some of those, too. <laughs> uh, Mayor Tomasevich, do you want to just highlight a few things? Uh, sure. Uh, well, so bearing in mind that we are in power uh, for a very short time, I would say from the previous uh, government, I, I'll mention some things which I think are uh, models that we want to increase. Uh, we have something called uh, neighborhood assemblies, and these are, uh, it's by the statute, uh, their decision when the citizens meet and discuss with the members of the representatives of the local government, the, their decision is uh, 
uh, mandatory for the for the uh, city district level. So it's it's a, a lower level than the, the whole city. And there, uh, this this uh, level of the government in Zagreb is more advisory to the mayor and to the city parliament. But this was uh, happening for several occasions. Uh, we actually actively involved, were involved in this, where some of the city projects, uh, local neighborhood projects, we discussed actually with citizens. Uh, and uh, this is the model that we want to increase more in uh, in our mandate. Uh, also, um, something which was uh, what we did in the local campaign before the elections, instead of a lot of parties which were giving us gift, uh, pencils and things like that, we decided to give two gifts. One was uh, an IT tool where we actually uh, built through volunteer uh, work of our members uh, uh, application where the citizens and journalists can uh, advance search through all the decisions of the mayors for the last 20 years. So they can, through keywords, search through all the hard copy decisions of the mayors related to everything, to like even office space rent, particular office space, I mean really everything, to discover, to bring more transparency to, and to control the government. And this also will be applied to us now. And the second, and second uh, uh, gift that we gave was the uh, we bought uh, a mobile uh, air quality uh, measuring stations, and we placed them all around the city. And we uh, plugged into API of city institutions, which have low number of these air quality stations. So we network with the official ones, and we put the whole network online. So citizens could check their air quality in every single city district, which was not the case before. And once we came in power, actually, it's a funny story, uh, the API of these city institutions was stopped for some reason. I guess they were like, okay, maybe now, you know, if you have air quality not so good, maybe this is not a good case for the new government. And we then said, no, 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 continue with that. We want to be transparent with that. Even though this will make problems, maybe, but we have to build trust with people. I mean, if we hide these things, we will not, you know, we will, even if there are problems with the air quality, we have to be transparent about it. And we need some time to solve them, but this is not the way to build this trust, I mean. Uh, and the third thing, this is the experiment we did in this first 100 days, and we will see how it will go. Uh, School boards, uh, so every school in Zagreb has a board and three representatives from the city uh, government and usually the mayor was just appointing these members who were running the schools. I mean, they're managing boards of the schools. And we decided uh, to have one of three representatives to be representative of the neighborhood council, no matter which party it's coming from. So it's the neighborhood council who is choosing it. So even the, the, there where we don't have majority, we accept it because we want the neighborhood council to be in a good relationship with the school in this neighborhood. And the other two representatives are actually, we invited citizens to apply for this school board. We had a public tender and we established this public tender in the middle of August. So for, I think from 12th of August until 27th of August. So during the summer vacation time, and they had to even apply by post for official reasons by snail mail, by regular post, not by email. And this was an experiment. It was 400 seats, and we didn't know how many people will apply. I mean, it's in the middle of the August. Summer vacation time, especially in Croatia, is very big, as you know. And actually, for these 400 seats, we, res we received more than 3,000 applications. So this, and, and when you look at now these applications, these are really, I mean, well-respected members of the community, regular people who really want to, and you know, there's almost no fee for that. So they really want to do it to participate, to, to participate in the governance of the schools. And uh, so it's an experiment which so far had a good response, but we will see, I mean, of course, how, how this will go in future. So, so uh, we will update you on that soon. <laughs> Once you open the windows for transparency, it can be difficult because then, but uh, I think it's essential and, and trust. So um, uh, just invite. 
Very, very briefly, um, of course, new technologies, digitalization, this is everything would helps us, helps um, uh, help our citizens to um, take all the matters they need to do with the city administration. But uh, we really need to remember about um, all those people who are um, excluded from the from the di digi digital services, and this is the real question: how to do it. I don't know how it is in your cities, but uh, in Gdansk, a number of people who are over 60, 65 years old are growing. Of course, they are um, more and more open to new technologies, but there is still quite a big group of people who are um, uh, excluded from the from the d digital services. And this is a real question: how to make them uh, involved into into city life during COVID times? It was not really easy, but what we did. Um, using uh, not only website but also uh, telephone number um, uh, the hotline we uh, had a um, platform called Gdańsk Pomaga, Gdańsk Helps and they cre created it to put people together those who wanted um, help those who wanted uh, uh, be a volunteer, those who wanted to um, give something, I don't know, food or some kind of help, with those who needed this help. And it really worked a lot um, and it was quite a successful idea because we tried to put not only new technology but also those traditional because we uh, not only technology help technology helps us, but also we need uh, quite often personal mm, personal uh, touch, personal um, relation. Uh, so um, another example where technology um, helps us during this uh, COVID situation, and uh, we do think mm, that uh, we are using it even now when schools are open quite normally. Mm, uh, it's special platform, education platform. We created it long time before COVID, I don't know, four years ago. Uh, and uh, it was not really used by uh, students and uh, parents and teachers because it, it is a platform to put people together to stay in touch when they didn't have to be in touch because they were every day at school. We, we didn't have to use it but uh, it gives us um, really uh, an opportunity to be with not only students but also with parents uh, together not only for educational reasons but also to stay in touch is everything if everything is okay uh, in a sense of uh, healthy situation uh, economical situation and so on and so on thank you thank you um, last word on this topic before we invite the audience for a brief question. Um, Ms. Boney, anything to add on the innovation side? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think innovation is not only technological, it's also social innovation and administrative uh, innovation, political innovation. And, and of course, as Eurocities, we can definitely be used as a platform for inspiration and when feasible, replication in this respect of all, you know, types of practices or tools. I mean, it can also work for technological tools, if you think, not easy, but it can work. I mean, if you think of Decibim, uh, the Barcelona tool that has been <laughs> copied by many, including the EU, uh, but also on other types of methodologies uh, that like Mayor um, uh, of, uh, of um, Gdansk has just uh, explained, uh, you know, methodologies like that, or also the other mayors have explained neighborhood uh, forums, design, climate assemblies, petitions, work with schools, like described by the mayor of Zagreb. So, I mean, and also, I mean, that's also important, uh, innovation in the administration, because if you want to do these kind of things, then you have also to, again, change the way in which public officials work and conceive working with citizens. And it's really about innovating and, and you know, again, becoming an administration that facilitates and innovates, and that we can exchange. But something that maybe on this we could uh, we could do as a network is really to try and advocate 
for more dedicated funding to participatory processes to help this uh, more open governance, um, help cities to, you know, have more resources to uh, push towards this direction of more open governance, more participatory governance, and so on. It's, you know, it could be uh, linked uh, to specific tools and so on, but more generally, this is something where uh, cities have to really find uh, ways to, to invest uh, and so on. And we could even think of, you know, creating a European participation strategy and so on to, to you know, have it, uh, 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 you know, get to give it a European framework to support that. And maybe the Conference on the Future of Europe will hopefully maybe help to demonstrate again that cities can help uh, to restore local democracy and therefore uh, have a better, you know, connection with, with citizens and improve, again, public policy at all levels. So as a, as a network, we can do many things. We can be uh, very, you know, supportive to the, to the cities and to also, um, you know, Europe as a whole, in a way, to be, so that it becomes a much more participatory continent, if I may say so. Thank you. Uh, we're almost at time. I see one hand up, um, two hands. Um, so I think we'll have time for one, one very brief question that I'll invite one of you to answer, and then we'll uh, go ahead and close with the video of uh, Governor Dean. So right there in the third row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Liu Shizhong. I'm Taiwan's ambassador uh, to Hungary. I would like to thank the municipality of Budapest for inviting two mayors of Taiwan to join the forum later. Um, my, my question to uh, three distinguished mayors is, um, there's an issue uh, throughout the entire pandemic, that is the extent to which the central government can cooperate with the local government. I'm sure you all have done excellent jobs in your local levels. In Taiwan, um, Taiwan has managed the pandemic quite well. Um, in the past more than one month, Taiwan has been able to maintain single-digit COVID cases on a daily basis. The key is a very close partnership between central and local government. But in, all, in most cases, we all also see you know, central and local government, they are pointing finger at each other, they are competing for resources, they are claiming you know, credits. So I was just wondering, uh, perhaps you can share with you, uh, with the audience, exactly in what way can local government working closely with the central government and to put aside partisanship and also to forge a national unity in, the, in this very difficult time. Thank you. Who wants to take it? Anyone? Maybe uh, I'll be the first one. Well, uh, when you want to build a trust and dialogue, you need to have both sides ready to do it. And this is always the case, um, not only during COVID times, not only during this specific case. Mm, we are here with some representatives of uh, Polish cities, also mayor of Warsaw and so on and so on. I can uh, tell you that we had, I don't know, several meetings, online meetings with prime minister, with ministry of, uh, minister of health and so on and so on. But so what? you have the meeting, you are trying to discuss, you are trying to present some solutions, uh, but then they say nothing, and then uh, one hour later, or the day later, um, they just uh, organize press conference and they say, tomorrow we are opening the kindergarten. Why they didn't say it uh, during the meeting? <laughs> so that we could discuss how to do it. So when you want to build the cooperation, it must be done from the both sides. Very simple. Okay, I think um, we're at our, our time's end here. And I want to, first of all, um, thank Mayor Karashan again for the warm welcome here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think this first panel underscores how important the Budapest Forum is by bringing together uh, an opportunity to share ideas and experiences. Um, I think we had a lot of food for thought here. Um, first of all, building up trust requires transparency, even if it means turning the mirrors onto yourself. Engaging youth, we love the naivety because they don't understand uh, the borders, reaching out and having citizens engage. You got 3,000 applications for the, the school board and they want to be involved if they see 
that it's possible. Be responsive, the call center, we're great. The people know that they can call up and working with New York City, learned an innovative skill. So these forums and, and reaching out for best practices from others. Um, I would also add that women are important. Our, our research uh, through NDI shows that women are viewed as more innovative, um, trustworthy, um, honest, and they would listen. So put women at the table, don't leave them half of the population um, out and of course finally education. Um, so I want to just um, thank uh, Mayor Dulkovich, Thomas Sejic and Vala for being with us today and Ms. Boney for uh, zooming in from uh, the Euro cities and just let's give our participants a grand round of applause. Thank you so much for being here.